Good morning. Happy Sunday morning, everyone. Praise God. This is his day. And he's awakened us so that we can enjoy his day with him. For God, it's all about us. His love for us. As one of his creations, we enjoy the love and protection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we enjoy that because there's no limit to the love that God has for us. Now, he's a just God. He demands that we be righteous, be made righteous, that we be set apart for him only because he created us. We can't go astray uh, going after other gods. But when we choose him, we are uniquely loved and cared for. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning so thankful for your love. The love that you give us, the protection, the guidance, the wisdom, compassion, your mercy, your grace, all that is you, God, that you share with us, enriches, restores, and makes beautiful the life that we live. And we thank you and honor you, because without you, our world would be dark. Pray, dear God, that this lesson today encourages someone to draw closer to you so that you may have the right to bless that person's life. Thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior forever. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, this Sunday's lesson, Lesson 10, is titled, Christ's Model for the Church. And it says, Believers should minister to one another and experience spiritual growth together. The lesson overview says, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, is often interpreted with a missional focus especially because of the well-known list about ministry, Ephesians 4.11. However, the minister works hand-in-hand hand with the saints, verse 12. In fact, verses 11 through 16 are all one sentence in the Greek. Therefore, the theme of unity emerges as a catalyst for Christ's model for the church. What are mission statements or five-year plans worth without the effective glue of unity? When we develop unity as strategically as we develop missional ideals, we become a different kind of community of faith. Christ leads us into unity first and then into ministry and a maturation process that includes growth. Golden texts from the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 and it reads that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait 
to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, we need to mature and grow. <clears throat> so that we can be discerning uh, because of the tra craftiness of those entities that are lying in wait to deceive us and to steal our blessings. All right, section one, maintain unity, Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six. Ephesians 4, 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Amen. Amen. The commentary says, Ephesians 4 begins with the apostles urging the Christians in Ephesus to live consistently with God's call to them through the gospel. That's Ephesians 4.1. If the Ephesians are uncertain of what it looks like to walk in a worthy manner consistent with one's call, Paul provides four characteristics of this kind of lifestyle. Lowliness or humility is about showing difference to others not thinking too highly of oneself, to esteem others greater than oneself. Meekness or gentleness means to con consciously exercise self-control, to choose to be gentle instead of forcefully or forceful when opposed by another. Verse 2. Um, long suffering is necessary if one is not to get angry too quickly. Verse 2. Forbearance is necessary if one if one is to put up with someone or something that is irritating or annoying. Verse 2. Without forbearance, one can end up bitter against another person. Finally, believers are to live endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 3, this is the unity produced by the Spirit who indwells all true believers, binding them together. Next, Paul sets out to express the foundation of their unity. First, Paul emphasizes the common experience of the Ephesian Christians in relation to the Holy Spirit. They are the one people of God who are members of Christ's body. Verse 4. Second, they all have a common hope in the gospel. Verse 4. This hope for which they all long and wait is 
experience the fullness of salvation they will one day realize at the Lord's coming. Again, third, they all have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 5. Finally, they all are children of one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 6. The repetition of all in verses in verse 6 drive home Paul's message that they are united in the family of God whether or not they always see the reality of it in their church family. <clears throat> Section 2. Minister to the body. And the reference is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And it reads, Ephesians 4, 7, But in, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended <clears throat> is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And the commentary says, Previously, Paul spoke of his own ministry as the grace of God given to him. Ephesians 3, 2. Elsewhere, when Paul speaks of gifts or graces, he has in mind what some refer to as spiritual gifts. See Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11. There, as in Ephesians 4, 7, Paul does not state that any one gift is given to all Christians, but that each one has been given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Verse 7. Paul next states that the gift giver in this case is Christ. Verse 8, the gifts Jesus gave are actually people, those who are called and equipped to minister to the local church. Verse 11, apostles is used to refer to the twelve, as well as others like Paul. Prophets are new covenant prophets who spoke to the church a spontaneous, spirit-prompted word from the Lord, which was for encouragement, exhortation, and or warning. Verse 11. Evangelists are people who speak the good news of the gospel of God as they go about from place to place. Verse 11. Pastors and teachers are linked closely together. Pastors are those who lead a local congregation. They do this by teaching the Bible, protecting the church from false teaching, and serving as the chief administrator of the church. Teachers are those who are gifted at instructing others in God's word. <clears throat>
Christ gave these gifts to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These gifts are service gifts to see Christians mature. They are training gifts to see Christians take their part in gospel ministry. Section 3. Mature in Christ together. That's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Ephesians 4, 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself and love. Well, the commentary says, Paul now arrives at the goal of the equipping ministry described in Ephesians 4, Verses 11 and 12, which is unity and maturity in the faith. The faith being the gospel, the knowledge of the Son of God. In addition to unity around right teaching, the church is to mature unto a perfect man. Verse 13, the measure of full maturity is the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 13, the idea is that Christians strive to be Christ-like in all areas of their lives. The mature, Christ-like person described in verse 13 is contrasted with the children in verse 14. What they were, children, in their understanding, they were not to remain. Someone who is a child is easily led astray by false teaching. Verse 14, for the maturing community of faith and Christians, false teaching loses its grip and appeal. In contrast to those false teachers who lie in wait to deceive others, the church is to be a place where believers are speaking the truth to one another in love. Speaking truth without love abuses others. Loving without speaking truth enables others to keep making mistakes. However, speaking the truth in love empowers others to mature and grow into the head who is Christ. Verse 15, Christ is the one holding the entire church together 
and making it grow into his likeness. Each member of the body has something to contribute to the health and well-being of the entire body as each one works according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Each member has a part to play in the growth of the body of Christ. Whether one is a pastor or teacher or one who benefits from such ministry. Let me read that last part of chapter again. Christ is the one holding the entire church together and making it grow into his likeness. Each member of the body has something to contribute to the health and well-being of the entire body as each one works according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Each member has a part to play in the growth of the body of Christ. Whether one is a pastor or teacher or one who benefits from the ministry. Okay. The Call to Discipleship. The Reverend John Wesley impacted England with the gospel by training preachers and group leaders who were mostly lay ministers. In 1777, Wesley declared, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God and I care not a straw, whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon earth. This is from the letters of John Wesley, 1777, to Alexander Mather, Bristol, August the 6th, the Wesley Center Online. Wesley's ministry vividly illustrates today's lesson. All of us have a role, a part to play in local church ministry, whether as paid clergy or church members, set out to cultivate and use the gifts God has granted you for the edification of the local church. Amen. This lesson is, is about unity and maturity and how we are to grow together in wisdom and knowledge of the Word of God so that we can be effectual tools used by God to spread the good news. I pray that this lesson encourages you to seek unity and maturity in your church when you go later today. Be that light. Be that encouragement. Be that truth spoken in love. Thank you and have a blessed Sunday.